Am I centered? Am I? Good enough? All right. I don't want to... This way? That's what I thought. All right. We're like cat with whiskers. You, you do it the wrong way, we're going to tilt. It's not even true, is it? My name is Josh Simmons. I'm actually the, the assistant pastor here at Reality Church. Welcome if you are new with us. I'm pumped to be back on stage. It's been a while. Um, what are some of the things you're glad aren't permanent that you won't have to do forever? For me, one that jumps off at the top is husking corn. I can't even explain why I hate uh, this so much because I love corn on the cob. Well, I guess I do know. I guess I just wish it didn't make me work so hard to enjoy its many delicious juicy corn niblets. And the other reason I guess is, and I don't know if it's just coincidence or because my hatred for this chore is so great that it affects the meteoric spheres of our atmosphere, but every time I husk corn, it's like a thousand degrees outside, every time. I always end up losing my shirt because the sun scorched it off of me, thus causing the corn stick mane to get stuck on places it's no business being stuck on. But on a side note, corn is just amazingly weird, isn't it? It's like rows and dirt on long, hard stalks, and it's wrapped in like three layers of this green fabric-like turtleneck material. And then underneath it all is hundreds of golden hair. The other thing that's really cool and amazing is, is how most of us eat it. We eat it like it's the last meal on earth, like we don't even care what we look like. And uh, something else that I'm glad isn't permanent um, is throwing up. I will do anything not to throw up. When something's trying to come up the one-way throat canal, what do you do? You keep swallowing, right? Well, swallowing never works and only delays the inevitable, but I don't care. If there's even a minute chance that it's going to help, I will swallow the heck out of my saliva. It, it will be like a tournament of swallowing up in there. Something else that I'll do that I think might help, if, if I think it might help, is to confess and lay down every sin before the Lord. God, I don't know what I did, but please keep this acidic lava from spewing out of me. Lord, you made me in your image. I'm a human, not a volcano. Aren't you super pumped that husking corn and throwing up ends, that it's not a permanent Thing. I'm not a big show me a sign God kind of person. I've asked for them before, but I've found that God often doesn't work that way, at least not in the way I'm looking for or asking for. But when I asked him what he wanted me to share this weekend, literally 30 seconds later, I find myself behind a truck that had a huge sign on the back of it that read, it's temporary. With the name of someone beside it, which I assumed was a loved one that had passed on from this life. This word that I'm bringing this morning isn't just for all of us. It's for all of me. And it's a word that God wanted me to get in that moment. When I pulled up behind that truck that day, I wasn't taking my own advice. I wasn't adhering to my most favorite repeated truth. I tell myself that worry never changes anything for good. I was worrying intensely about something, trying to fix something that I had no power to fix or change to the point where I was experiencing negative physical symptoms. I was treating it like it was a permanent, this is going to go on forever thing. I was fixating on it like that was all there was to see. But little did I know how this word, this sign would continue to speak to me and help me beyond that moment. Just a few weeks later, my own loved one would pass on from this life, my dad. This morning, I believe God wanted me to post up this sign for you to see and digest as well. This morning, he wants to remind you that it's temporary. It's temporary. This season, this heartache, this loss, this difficulty, this pain, this trial, this wealth, these things, this life, it's not permanent. It's temporary. Paul says it like this in Romans 13. This is all the more urgent. For you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. Now that term, day of salvation, it has a dual meaning. It's the day when a person receives Jesus as Lord and Savior. It could have been 
yesterday. It could have been June 14th, 1945. It could be tomorrow. But it's also the day when a follower of Jesus crosses over from this life and into the next. One is the promise received, and the other is the fulfillment of that promise. In 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Paul says, For God says at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus and that amazing promise of heaven and the forgiveness of sins, Paul would plead with you here and tell you, don't waste another moment without Jesus. Without his assurance. Without knowing where you'll spend eternity. Today is the day. It could be the day for you of salvation. But in Romans 13, Paul is pleading with those who already received that promise. And he's saying, let me Joshify this, if you will. Homies, homesesses, do you realize how fast this time is flying by? It's running out. Our time is running out. Let's re-examine what in the world we're doing here. Before we know it, we'll be closing our eyes and opening them with Jesus staring back at us. Don't we all seem to live believing that we won't get old? When we're kids, we can't even picture being our parents' age. And when we're our parents' age, we can't imagine being our parents' age. We can't see ourselves looking like that, thinking like that, walking like that, getting bent out of shape about that. And then we have these special moments where we catch a glimpse of their reflection in us and through how we parent or how we fold laundry, organize a toolbox, 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 or cut carrots. And we note a similar smile and frown lines that have been carved seemingly overnight through our forehead and cheeks. But even with all the evidence, we can't see ourselves as there, as old. Someone said, denial exists when three beliefs intersect. The belief that it cannot happen, the belief that it cannot happen to you, and the belief that it cannot happen to you now. I wonder how many of us are in denial about our own mortality, that it will happen, that it will happen to you, and that it could happen to you at any time. That one day you won't be here doing the things you've always done, going to the store to get milk, planning the summer vacation, having coffee on the deck, playing golf with the guys, sitting down to watch a movie. Can we just spend a few moments facing the truth that secretly terrifies all of us from time to time? It's really important to do so because our fears, our worries, our concerns, if we call on Jesus, aren't valid. I want to remind us of how crazy ridiculous that moment will be. That moment when we're taken from all we know, all we do. Can we redraw and reimagine just how spectacular that celestial moving day will be? I love Psalm 19.1. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. And night after night, they make him known. In Sarasota, Florida, they have this park where you can go and hang out with the flamingos. They will eat out of your hand. You can whisper sweet somethings into their flamingo ears. You can play music from your phone and attempt to dance with them if you like. I remember the first time I experienced this. And the whole time, I was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe these flamingos are giving me the time of day. I was feather struck. <laughs> there is something about their long, curved pink necks that gives me goosebumps. Don't worry, I love my wife. I have story after story of how this created world has wowed me to the point of tears and brought the highest levels of joy and amazement to my soul. I'm sure you do as well. But that's not on accident. That's on purpose. 
And it isn't the flamingo or the highest mountains or the clearest Caribbean oceans that deserve our deepest all. It's the artist who carefully and thoughtfully crafted and spoke them into existence that should leave us fumbling over our words and weak at the knees as we interact with them. All of the beauty, the wonder, and the creativity, the attention to detail that this world shows off are all singing in harmony to a song that declares the glory of God and what's to come in a world that isn't cloaked over by evil, sin, and death. In other words, you think this present world is something you ain't seen, nothing yet. Think flamingos that will actually dance with you and let you ride down their long, more vibrant pink necks and high wing you on the way down. There are so many more heaven scriptures that I can give you, but let me give you just one that I think sums them all up. It's a familiar one. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, come on. I know none of us will fully ever absorb this, but let's try to absorb it a little bit more. If God's not holding back his only son, from being sent into a world that he knows the majority will not only reject him, but who would bully him, who would physically, verbally, and emotionally abuse him and torture and kill him in the most excruciating way. If he loves even those who hate them, if he left the door of heaven for those open who even murdered him, what do you think he's going to do for those who accept and follow him? Trust me when he says that he's not holding back when it comes to how we're going to spend eternity with him. Sometimes it's the failure to see heaven for what it really is, and sometimes it's our failure to see this world for what it really is that keeps us from waking up for our salvation is nearer now than we first believed kind of life. This is an amazing world, and it's full of so many things that make us never want to leave it. But at the same time, we don't need reminded of all the things that cause us to yearn for something so much more. Paul gives us words to sometimes how we feel in 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and sigh, but it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on new bodies so that these dying bodies can be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this, and as a guarantee, he has given us the Holy Spirit. Paul says, all of us, me, you, we groan inwardly. We grow weary in our dealings living in this world. We groan and grow weary because of all the family and relational drama that we go through. We groan and grow weary when our kids make choices that we know is hurting them. We groan and grow weary when we lose someone close to us or someone that we know is dealing with a major medical issue. We groan, we grow weary over the families losing everything because missiles and bombs have destroyed everything around them. We groan, we grow weary because there's such a thing as sex trafficking. We groan, we sigh because we're tired of mass shootings and senseless murders and violence. We groan, we grow weary because we've got loved ones who are controlled by alcohol and drugs or because our sin convinced us and pulled us away from what was better again. But mostly we groan, we grow weary, we sigh. Because we're homesick. Because our citizenship is in heaven. So how are we to live in this tension between now and our day of salvation? How do we live with a temporary mindset in a sin-drenched, constantly bringing us pain world? Well, Paul wrestled with this very question. And his God-inspired answer leads him to write one of the most beautiful yet shocking sentences ever written. For to me, to live is Christ, 
and to die is gain. Paul says, for me, to me, to me, this side of heaven, this side of heaven, is to make it about Jesus. It's to glorify him. That's my number one goal. Everything else in my life orbits around him for me. And he says, for me, on the other side of heaven means I'll get to be closer to Jesus. So how could that not be better? Listen to the rest of Paul's inner dialogue that he has with himself that he lets us in on. Verse 22, if I'm going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better for me, better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you, again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Listen, it's temporary. It's temporary aren't words that should motivate us to quit or to give up or lay aside our responsibilities as a citizen, as a parent, as an employee, as a student, as a neighbor, as a father, as a teenager, and definitely not as a follower of Jesus because to live isn't you. And to live isn't Josh Simmons. To live isn't to make everything and everyone around us gratify all of our whims, needs, and desires. To live was never meant to point people to us. I'm beautiful. I'm special. I'm like a majestic mountain, Calvin, a beautiful ocean, a, a crazy cool flamingo. But my purpose and presence wasn't created to attract and pull everyone to be with me, to gawk over me. My ultimate purpose is to attract and pull people to Jesus, to want to be with Jesus, to gawk over Jesus. To live has to be Christ because there is no one better. There is no one greater. There is no one wiser. There is no one more powerful. There is no one more loving. There is no one more forgiving. There is no one more understanding. And there is no one more truth giving. And there is no one more capable to get us and them to where ultimately they need to be. To live has to be Christ because we can only go so far and do so much. And to live has to be Christ because he's made death our gain. He took what should have been our finality and made it our temporary. How could we not make it about him? When we get this, when we really, really get this, that we really are mortal and our time really is running out, and when we get that because we've got a God who didn't withhold his best from us, he's not going to withhold the kind of eternity that will make our current dig seem like a garbage dump. And when we get that God didn't create us to point people to us but to him, then and only then will we be able to live like our lives don't end here. Then and only then will we be able to go and do what scripture actually calls us to. Scriptures like 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us, look at your neighbor and say produce, a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen, for the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Let's let that sink in for a second. We've got to stop ourselves from skimming over astounding truths like this. Think about what that's saying. Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity, God, is saying, I know it's hard. I know it seems long. But I've got this interesting position and perspective. And I'm telling you what you're going through. I know you can't see it, and I know you can't feel it with your physical senses. But I see your entire life from birth to eternity. And this thing you're going through, it's just a blip. And it's nothing compared to what I'm going to produce for you through it. Through every single trouble, disaster, tragedy, and trial. I want to look at this scripture in the Amplified Version, which gives us some of the original Greek 
added in to really help us understand what God is trying to communicate to us. For our momentary light distress, this passing trouble, is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, a fullness beyond all measure, surpassing all comparisons, a transcendent splendor beyond human experience, and an endless blessedness. Dang. So somehow, God is going to take our earthly struggles and tragedies and produce something so amazing for us in heaven that there literally isn't anything that we could compare it to. Think about that. Think about who's saying that. God is the one who's saying there isn't anything in your mind that you could possibly imagine in your wildest dreams that could compare to what I'm going to produce for you through it. I don't know about you, but transcendent splendor and unending blessedness sounds really good. Any, am I the only one? We can't get that here. Next time you book your, your hotel room or Airbnb, ask them if they can guarantee transcendent splendor and unending blessedness. John Piper says this about this truth. Every time something horrific happens, an interviewer will say, meaningless. That death, this is meaningless. And that is what it looks like, at least from our perspective. But may I venture to see, John Piper says, that every millisecond of your misery in the path of obedience of following Jesus is producing a peculiar glory you will get because of that suffering. He continues, I don't care if it was slander or sickness. It wasn't meaningless because 2 Corinthians 4.17 says that my light momentary, lifelong, total affliction is doing something. It's doing something. It isn't meaningless. End quote. Paul says, since this is happening, since God's going to give meaning to our misery, verse 18, don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen, for the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. What are the things we cannot see? What are the things Paul is telling us to fix our gaze on instead of the trial, instead of the problem? He's telling us to fix our gaze on the promise instead, the promise that you can't see now, but that is being produced out of this very trial. This light, momentary affliction is working for you and for me, an eternal, incomparable weight of glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. I believe God gave me a window into a little of what this might look like through a dream I had about my dad a few months before his passing. And I had no idea that my dad was going to pass. It, it was unexpected. So it wasn't on, even on my radar, on my mind. And when it comes to my dreams, there are only a handful in my entire life that I still remember to this day. Most of them get lost by morning. But this one, I am certain, I will never forget. The last two years of my dad's life, were absolutely horrible. Without going into a lot of detail, he was stuck laying in, his, in a bed for 18 months straight. Everything happened in that bed. Everything. And there's good and bad to this. He was in his right mind as much as you could be when you're in bed for that long. And we got to see him and talk to him and spend time with him. That was the good part. But when you're in your right mind and you know that and you're living in that, I, I can't even imagine, I couldn't even imagine myself being and living in that kind of reality. In addition to that, my dad had over 10 knee surgeries in his lifetime. I don't have any memories of my dad not walking without a limp in pain. A few months ago, I had the most vivid dream of, my, of walking into a stadium and seeing my dad running. My dad's not a runner. He wasn't running around a track. He was just running in the stadium somehow. We made eye contact, and he acknowledged me, but he told me that he, he couldn't talk with me, but that he would when he could. Now, my dad would never do that. He would never not stop what he was doing and spend time with me and talk with me, never. But in this dream, he continued running freer than I'd ever seen him with no hesitation in his 
stride, no grimace in his eyes, but that wasn't the best part. It was the look in his eyes. That was the best part. I can't even explain the look in his eyes, the look in his face, the joy that was coming out of him. And I really struggled to, how to communicate this part to you all. I was thinking, what could I compare to to the look in his eyes and the joy coming out of him? I'm really good with words. But everything I kept coming up with felt short. It could not compare. And so I thought, I guess the only way to describe what he must have been feeling and experiencing was incomparable, transcendent splendor and unending blessedness. There are so many things in this life that are screaming for us to obsess over, to treat as if they're forever. It's so easy to fall into the trap of thinking all of this is all there is, but this isn't even a morsel of all there is. It's the real and truer eternal things that should shape and direct our temporary, ever-changing earthly things. When we live in denial of our true for us reality, when we get our home address mixed up, when we begin to live here like we aren't citizens of heaven, it will cause us to get stuck in these lifelong patterns of focusing on the not working out so great areas of our very temporary seasons and circumstances with the permanent gaze. But the moment the temporal becomes our permanence is the moment we lose what matters most. There is this song that I asked the team to lead us in and the lyrics couldn't fit more perfectly with the truth of what 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 is saying. And the purpose of singing this song together is to help us cement in our hearts and minds what God is saying to be true over what our present worlds, what our circumstances, what our own feelings are saying to be true. The chorus goes, behold, 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 what love can do, behold, behold. He's making all things new. Song is found, it's 
living with a temporary mindset going to affect and change your present realities. Because when life is truly temporary, we make things right. When life is really temporary, we stop procrastinating. When life absolutely is temporary, we orient our lives around Jesus and the life he's calling us to live or at least going after something and finding what that is for our purpose. Those first steps of seeking. What does it mean for you right now? What very specific thing might the Spirit of God be leading you to do? How might He be leading you to fill in this statement? Because it's temporary, I'm going to what? I just want to give you 30 seconds right now. Put that in your phone, write it on a piece of paper. How might he be leading you to fill in this statement? Because it's temporary. I'm going to what? What action needs to be taken? What conversation might need to be had? What sin needs to be finally confronted and dealt with? What appointment needs made? What new habits need formed or developed? Why should we live a temporary mindset kind of life? Well, because the day of salvation is closer now than when you first believed. Heaven is rushing at you full speed. You might not have all day. And the heavens proclaim the glory and the goodness of God day after day, night after night they make him known. If God didn't withhold his one and only son, he's not going to withhold eternity from us. Why should we live a temporary mindset kind of life? Because the moment we mix up what's really temporary and what's really permanent is the moment We'll live for ourselves. But if to live isn't Christ, to die isn't gain. If to die isn't gain, what's the point of living? We've got to make it about him because none of our true wants and questions and answers and needs and the way better ultimate outcome can be found by us. And lastly, 
We should live with a temporary mindset because in Christ, regardless of how long, of how hard our painful seasons and trials are, we know that in light of eternity, we, they are actually small. They are actually short, and they are actually producing an incomparable forever, transcendent blessedness. Let's pray. God, for every single person, for me, for every person on the stage, for every seat filled, God, they're your children. You're our Father. And so, God, I pray that you would father us toward living our lives like they really are temporary, living our lives like we, you, you really do have a purpose and a plan for us, and, and, and the cent- central plan and purpose is to glorify you with all of our gifts, with all of our wonder, and the way you created us. So God, I pray that you would lead us specifically, personally, as well. God, what conversation, what, what drama, what, what, what thing that we've been avoiding, what conflict, what is, it, what is your spirit leading us personally? God, we thank you that you're a personal Heavenly Father, that you don't, you, you don't roll for, with this, this long white robe and, and this pointed finger. God, you love us. You, you, you called us and, and you want us to call us your, your Father, the perfect Heavenly Father. So God, I pray, I invite you to Father us. Closer to you, closer to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Hope you guys are glad that you came today. Hope you got something out of that. Um, hope you come back next week. Um, if you're new, check us out at the guest service table. Um, if we need the chairs set up, so those of you who signed up to do that, if you're interested in helping with the chairs, you could just come down and Benjamin, uh, if you don't know who Benjamin is, you will see him down here. All right, have a great rest of your weekend.